Hey folks, it is the latest COVID-19 special self-isolation episode of Real Inspiration. And I've got two guys who have always inspired me here. Jonas Chernick, welcome, and Jeremy Lalonde. Welcome, you guys. Thanks, Priya. Thanks. It's nice to be here. Thanks for having us. We were both being very polite and we were waiting for each other to speak, Jonas. I like No, it. no, I just jumped right in and spoke over you. Oh, that's fair. I hope that that's going to happen more and more. We're going to see who's going to be the aggressor in this situation. Uh, Jeremy will always win that fight. <laughs> <laughs> good to know. Good to know. Thank Clocking that for later usage. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, can I ask where you both are? Jeremy, I think I know you're at your house in Kitchener outside the craziness of Toronto or the... No, we're, we, we're back in Toronto right now for the next couple of days. And then we're going back to Kitchener next week. Okay. Jonas, what about you? Uh, uh, I mean, I'm typically, I've been at home for a week straight. I have a, a little studio office. It's a one person, uh, entity. It's, uh, it's, it's good. It's good. It's suitable for one person. And, uh, it's about a block away from the house. So I, for the first time in, uh, definitely over a week have left the, left my kids and walked down to my studio and I'm sitting in my studio and I have two hours of of uh time to try to catch up on some work but it's been it's how many been walks impossible. between your house and your studio do you think it would take you to make up your ten thousand steps uh i go well i don't know that's a good question i have no idea what ten thousand steps looks like because i don't do that but i go for a jog every morning so i probably get my 20 my ten thousand steps you're getting yours i was out for a walk yesterday for an hour and 20 minutes and i got 7500 steps that's and good. I'm a fast oh, walker. Okay. Pretty, pretty close. A half hour walk is about 3,000 steps, roughly, depending on your pace. Yeah, I walk fast. I was a little disappointed at that. I'm like, how much longer can I walk? There's nowhere to go. Anyways, I digress. We're not here to talk about my 10,000 steps. We're here to talk about the, na the latest movie, a collaboration between you guys, called James versus His Future Self. I am so curious about how this collaboration started, because I know you've worked together before. I know, let's just talk about what you guys each do. First of all, Jonas, you're an actor primarily, but you've written before. You wrote your film, My Awkward Sexual Adventure. Jeremy, you're a writer, director, editor. You've written films that Jonas has been in, uh, How to Have an Orgy in a Small Town. You edit, you direct for TV. Where, where did this idea come from? Because I understand it was came out of How to Have an Orgy in a Small Town. Yeah, so yeah. I met <clears throat> I met Jonas. Uh, actually, it came out of Sex After Kids in a way because we were both at the Santa Barbara Film Festival. He was there with his film, My Awkward Sexual Adventure, and I was there with Sex After Kids, <clears throat> and we hadn't met yet. So uh, we were the only two sex comedy Canadian guys in in uh, Santa Barbara. So they forced us into a room together because uh, they didn't want us near anybody else. So uh, I want to know what happened in that room, but we'll talk about that off camera. And so I got to know Jonas as like a writer, producer, actor through his films, because he's done a bunch um, in that capacity. And so when it came time to uh, do How to Plan an Orgy in a Small Town, uh, Jonas and I were exchanging scripts and had become friends in that nerdy capacity. And he, uh, he convinced me to cast him in the movie, which was his one script note. I actually tricked him. I tricked him into casting me, which is how I get casted in most films. <laughs> In that, you know, he, we, he gave me the script and he was like, I'm going into production very quickly on this. And, uh, if you, you know, I'd love you to give it a read if, if you have any ideas or thoughts. And I read the script and I, I have never laughed so hard in my entire life reading a script by myself. I freaked out and I thought, I have to be in this. And thankfully, there was one male role he hadn't cast yet. The problem was the character was like 10 years too young for me to play him. So my suggestion, my one note was, I, I think this is working really well. I really think the relationship here with Chester, the dynamic would be a lot smarter. If, think about it, if he was older, if he was the age of the other characters, older, and then, you know, she looked up to him and blah, blah. And I gave this really impassioned speech and pitch about why I thought the character should be older. And Jared was like, well, yeah, that's a pretty good argument. I said, great, and I think you should cast me. <laughs> Just yeah. slid that in there. Yeah. So after five other actors turned us down, I went to oh. Jonas. <laughs> no, no, he cast right away. It was perfect. I actually hadn't, we were struggling with who to cast in that role. 
And so, it, I mean, it solved a bunch of problems for me. It solved, now I had another great actor in the film and also it made the, the character dynamic a bit uh, more unique and richer, I think. So, so after that, Jonas and I, you know, that furthered our relation, working relationship and Jonas was story editing another project of mine that I was developing. And then he and I went out for dinner one night and I just said, hey, I want to do something in this vein that's kind of sci-fi-y, but still in the vein of what, what I do. Do you have any ideas? And Jonas had literally one idea that he pitched to me. Yeah, I, 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 I'm one of these writers that I, I, don't, I don't have like, you know, a journal full of 80 ideas for a movie. I have one idea at any given time. And then I spend years making that movie. And then hopefully I get another idea. And that's worked out for me for four or five films. So I had this one idea that was just sitting in, in the sort of recesses of my imagination. I hadn't flushed it out, but I knew there was something. All I knew was it was a guy at, at war with himself from the future. That was, that was really all I had. I, I wasn't sure the context. I knew it was a time travel thing, but I, I didn't really know much more than that. And I. I, I threw that at him and he, he really liked it and, and we very quickly got super nerdy and excited and started to flesh it out. I, I want to talk about what that writing process was like to collaborate because you co-wrote the script. I mean, originally your idea, but then you, you did co-write the script. But before we get to that, let's talk about sex for a minute because- All right. Yeah. Let's just get into it, folks, because you're both, I love what you said, Jeremy, about you two being the only sex comedy writers. What is it with you guys and sex? Oh, God. Do you, how much time do you have? We have 40, we have like 40 minutes. <laughs> yeah, we're just going to get to the tip. Huh? Huh? Yeah. Oh, God. See? See what I did? Yeah, yeah. We'll do another <laughs> one where you can slide the rest in. No, no, no. Oh, you made it dirty. <laughs> oh, okay. Here we go. Well, I'm just taking my lead from the pros. That was a good one. That was really, that was well done. Thanks, guys. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I always, I think Jonas and I are very similar in our, in our kind of, um, and why we, I think we, we collaborated so well on, on this current film. It's because I think we both get a kick out of like finding comedy in the mundane uh and just trying to find like what are the what are the things underneath the things that people don't usually talk about and i think that's what makes it interesting for us and that's why for us you know even when we go to make a time travel movie we're gonna make something that's different than anyone else's time travel movie because our point of view is gonna be more about like the minutia of stuff and so when it came to sex i think it was you know how to plan an origin in particular came about just because i was trying to figure out i was looking at um you know, sexuality and that kind of stuff. And, and somehow, I think I, I was in a conversation with somebody about like group sex or, or threesomes and that kind of stuff. And, you know, it was obviously the sexiness to it, but then all I could think of is like, is the wonderful awkwardness that comes with that. Uh, and just, and especially when you deal, and I didn't have the, the idea for the small town for the longest time. I just had the ideas. I wanted to do a film called How to Plan an Orgy, had nothing. And then when I was, just kind of talking about it one day randomly, I just tagged on in a small town just to test out the idea on the person I was pitching. And they laughed really hard. And then instantly, because I'm from a small town, everything just kind of clicked. And I'm like, I have conflict, I have backstory, I have things to play with. And I think that's what made that idea really sing. Because now I knew how to tell that story and get into like the heart of it and the, and the, the, the real humor of it. Because I think Jonas and I are guys that I don't know, Jonas might feel differently about his own writing, but I don't know how to write a joke. Um, I know how to mine comedy from a situation mm -hmm. and that's kind of my strength, but I'm not a kind of guy that can sit down and, and write 10 like funny lines. Like the lines just kind of come naturally through the situation I'm in. Like if someone gives me a note to make a scene funnier, I have to write the, rewrite a screen, scene from scratch. I can't just go through it and make it 20% funnier. I don't know, I don't have that skill. Right, like you don't just punch it up. Yeah, I mean, we can do a little bit of that just some for some a little bit of wordplay, but generally for me, comedy just comes out of character and situation. It's not really a I'm not, I don't I may, and maybe that is joke writing, but to me, it's it's a different kind of thing. What about yeah, you? I'm not really a joke writer. I'm not really a joke writer either. Like, I, I don't think I could be in like a writer's room for a comedy series just pitching jokes. In fact. You know, Jeremy and I found it very helpful. We brought a bunch of the, when we were developing the script for Jins versus his future self, we asked all of our comedy writer friends if they would come and, and read the script with us and, you know, pitch ideas. 
And there was a lot of great stuff. I think maybe one ended up in the movie, which gets a good laugh. But for the most part, you know, for us, yeah, it comes out of character. And I would say for me, the sex thing was an accident because when I started writing my awkward sexual- <laughs> You're talking about writing, right? Or... Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the first time Jonas writing... had sex was an accident. He was by himself, <laughs> he was real scared. I've had a few of those as well. I've had a few of those as well. <laughs> when I started writing My Awkward Sexual Adventure, it wasn't a sex comedy. It was actually like a romantic comedy. It was more about like religion and like fish out of water kind of. And it took me years to kind of figure out that that story. Posters right there. Uh, the, the, it took me years to figure out that that story was a, a comedy about sex and about male, a sec, male sexual vulnerability and insecurity and. So I kind of staggered into it. The, the script, the two scripts that I had written, produced films that had been produced before that with my name in the writing credits were, one was a comedy, one was a psychological thriller. And then immediately after my awkward sexual adventure, I did like a father-daughter road trip coming of age story. So I'm kind of all over the map, but, uh, but I love writing comedy and writing this comedy with Jeremy was amazing on a bunch of different levels, but mostly what Jeremy's talking about, about how comedy comes very naturally to him through situation and character. I got to see that firsthand. And I'll segue into the second part of your question, Priya, because this is how we wrote together, was it was long brainstorming creative sessions where we just broke story, um, so to speak, and then we would write drafts independently and toss them back and forth. But sometimes Jeremy would send me these scenes and I, like, I have very specific memories of reading these scenes that we talked about in context. So we knew what was going to happen in the scenes and we knew what, where it was going. Then I'd read it and I would just laugh out loud for three pages and, and send him a text going like, I just laughed for three minutes reading this scene. And it wasn't that he was like joke after joke after joke, although it was, it was essentially that just, it was, but it didn't feel calculated like that. Like the characters were behaving in what I found really hilarious ways and it was i was able to riff off of that and sometimes add to it and sometimes a lot of times just leave it as it was um but but it was it, i would i was i learned a lot about writing comedy from this guy so uh -huh. let me just hone in that was a sweet moment guys yeah i'll just say nice things about him and then he'll just say mean things about me that's the dynamic it's like, it's a typical bromance we trade yeah. off in the next interview we do he'll be the mean one Awesome. I can't wait to see Jonas being mean. I don't think I've ever seen that on screen or off. Doesn't happen. I've never seen that in you, Jeremy, either. But I want to just go a little bit further into that writing process. So, Jonas, you said that um, you would each write scenes or you would each... No, drafts. You would write entire drafts on your own? Yeah, we, we, would, we would figure out exactly where it was going. We knew what was going to happen scene by scene. We'd break the story. We'd outline together. And then one of us would take a pass on it and send it to the other. And then the other would take a pass on that. And that happened back and forth for a long time until we got to almost to the finish line. It got to a certain point, and this, I've done this before when I've co-written with other writers who, who are going to direct the movie. If I'm co-writing with the director, it gets to a point where as the writer, I need to step back and say, okay, we're going into production now. This is your script and I'm here for you if you need me and I'm happy to spitball and help. But when it comes down to fine tuning now, you go back and forth, like for example, there'll be like a scene where I've got this idea for how it should, you know, the button on the scene, but maybe Jeremy's got this other idea. And often we would just, we'd flip the script back and forth and just keep changing it. And ultimately somebody's got to win that argument. And for me, it's always the director. So, you know, if, if, if those kinds of conflicts happen and they're not really, we don't fight about it, but you know what I mean? I'll just give it up and say, it's your movie and commit to it. Um, and so that happens near the end. And so Jeremy took the script over when we moved into production and I started to really focus on the acting part and preparing as an actor. Yeah, and if we get to that point where there's like two jokes we both love, usually we'll try to, make a note and shoot them both. You know, if, if anytime there's an option to shoot variations and alternates on things, we will and do. But I think, I mean, that's how I've written in the past. Like I've only, I've co-written a few things. This is the first thing I've co-written that's gotten produced. Uh, and I always like to do the first draft just because I'm, I'm pretty quick I, at, the, at my old vomit pass. I can usually spit out like a, a first draft in three or four days. Um, that is not good. 
uh, at all. It's uh, and uh, and then, but then it gives you something to work from, and you can look at it and be like, okay, here's here's a, a model of what we were looking for from that outline we did. Now let's tear it apart and see what we need to rebuild and make better and don't need. And, you know, in this case, I think the, the first draft turned out pretty good, but then it's almost, I think if you looked at the finished film versus that first draft, which had a totally different title and theme, uh, it's, it's, it's a very different movie. But it was necessary. Uh, it's interesting. I, I had this conversation with my son the other day. He was talking about like, he was getting mad and frustrated because he felt like he was working on something for two days and then it wasn't working and he told and he's like I wasted two days of my life on that and I was like you know when Jonas and I were working on this movie in particular I'm like the first year we were writing a totally different kind of movie and you could look at that at the end and say well we wasted a year writing by writing that other version but I said it took us a year to figure out that, that was the wrong way to go and that's that, a, that, that, that's, a, that, that's a lesson that I think it comes only with experience as a screenwriter. I mean, I know I, I remember feeling that way when I was writing my first screenplay in my 20s, is that, you know, you get really frustrated because you, you think it's done and you think it's great and then everybody reads it and says, well, you're on the right path. There's something in here, but this isn't it. And, you, just, you know, that ability to reinvent, to basically throw away what you've done and start over. At, I think in your younger years, and your son's only 10, so he's got a long ways to go to get, get this idea, but in your younger years, you feel like, it's hard not to think of that as a waste of time. And of course, with wisdom and experience and maturity, you realize that, oh no, I would never have gotten here if I hadn't started there. So it, it's all part of the process. How yeah. do you know though, when you <clears throat> are a starting writer, how do you know if you should just give up on that idea or if you should take the criticism, the constructive criticism that people are giving you, take in the fact that they're saying there's something here um, and just, be open to molding it like how do you know which way to go well that's just it i mean if you have so if you have a mentor or or an, or an experienced writer if you're lucky enough to have one two three of these individuals who are willing to read your script and and give you actual feedback if any of them are saying no no there's something here like work with this then i think that's the, that's the indication i also think you kind of know it in your bones but if it, but I've had ones where you know everybody that's read it has said, I don't really know what you're going for here, and you know Jeremy's big question is it, it has always been as a story editor as a reader, what are you going for here? Like what what are you trying? And and if you don't have an answer to that question, then I think you have to really seriously reconsider whether or not this is worth writing or or figure out what you're going for and yeah. come at it from that direction. So yeah. And, I, and in terms of like, like to, to Jonas's point, just the, the further on that is like, if you, I, I always like to have a couple people per round of script to send it to, to get feedback from. And I find if, if you get like the same note from more than one person, a couple people, usually they're right in some capacity. If you get five different notes from five different people, uh, and it's not all a negative, they're not all saying they hate it for different reasons. But then it's like per personal opinion. But I find that it's like if everyone's saying there's a problem here, they're right, whether or not you want to believe that, you know, you've got to accept that. And then part of the trick too, even to what Jonas was saying about my my thing about honing in on what are you trying to get at, is you know, people that read your scripts never have the right solution. They usually don't. They have their idea of what they would do. But what you have to do is you have to be a bit of a detective and go, okay, here's the note. A note is always right. A solution is usually wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, so you have to go, they were bumping on this and that's a fact. Whether or not what they think I should do with that is true or not is arbitrary. I've got to figure out what to do for my story. That's my job. But I can't ignore the fact that they bumped on this thing. Nobody wants to give you a note saying they didn't like something. They do that because they're pulled out of it for some reason. You know, and so you have to acknowledge that for whatever reason, whether that's, you know, reading a draft of a script or watching a, a, a rough cut of a friend's movie. Yeah. If you're stopping to make a note, it's because the movie pulled you out and that and you've got to acknowledge that that happened. Can I ask if you think ego plays into this at all and whether <laughs> that's something, again, that that kind of changes with experience? Yes. 
Uh, for me, yeah, uh, yes. Yeah, and, we're and, huge and... egomaniacs, so we. Uh... <laughs> well, 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 no, especially when you you think about how how hard it is to actually complete the screenplay. Uh, you know, even the what Jeremy calls the vomit pass, which right. is just that. Even get for for most writers, just getting that out on the page is is torture. It's so painful, and so I think, especially with young writers, what or inexperienced writers, what happens is that you get it out, and you're so proud of yourself for having accomplished this 102 page feat that it, it's you know it's it's easy to get sort of bloated with pride that you. You, you, I did it, I wrote a script. I have so many young writers that I've talked to or that I've worked with or story edited, you know, they, they think it's done. And, and when you come in and challenge it, 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 it there is ego involved. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and they want to think that they're, that they're great right away. And that's what, that's what being young is. It's that, it's, it's, you think that you're the best and that you know everything. And then you realize that you don't. So you definitely have to battle through the ego stuff, I think for sure. It's yeah, it's like, model, I think isn't it? like uh, it's interesting. Sorry, Jeremy, I'll let you finish in a second. Or maybe you go ahead and then no, I'll. No, no, you go ahead. You go ahead. Well, in terms of the, the ego, it's like you almost, you have to have enough confidence to stay in the game uh, to not let people just kill your confidence completely so that you just say, I'm never going to write another thing again. But you have to know when to take the criticism, be open to it because. Hopefully you've got, as you say, Jonas, you've got mentors that are looking out for you that have been doing this for a while and that have the experience to know what's good and what's not, what works and what doesn't. But you have to find that balance, right? Of taking in the criticism and not just crumbling under it. Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest challenge that young writers have is that they're not able to separate themselves from the material. They're not able to say, I'm here and the script's over here. And when they talk about the script, they're not talking about me. They're not saying that I have problems, you know, it's a, and be able to look at the script as something to work on together. And that it's like, the script is its own thing. And yeah, you created or you wrote it, but it's like, it doesn't mean that when someone's criticizing it, that they're criticizing you personally, they're just criticizing the thing, mm -hmm. you know? And so the idea is that if you want to make it, I mean, you can just make it and if you, if you just want it for yourself, sure. And sit there. But it's also, I think the idea is like, it's like watch, you know, it's rolling a boulder up a hill and then going, oh, fuck, that was tough. That was great. It's like I got up the hill and then go realizing, oh, but there's another hill with a, a heavier boulder and you got to go up that one next. And it just seems like so much more work. And also, I think people, they go, well, I thought I wrote a great scene. If I change one little thing, I don't know. But it's like, and my argument is always that, well, you know how to write a great scene. You wrote that great scene. I'm sure you could write another one that's more focused or more on point or whatever. It's just, I think people don't realize that that first draft is just like the starting gate. It, it's the beginning of a conversation. And that might be the hard, that, that might be the hardest part, of course. It's the killing your darlings, killing your babies. It's that, that even if that script doesn't work and you know on some level that the script doesn't work and you get all the smart feedback from all these mentors saying it doesn't work, it's still agonizing to have to go in and, and start over. And you know that some of those scenes that you that you thought were terrific and that maybe they were, maybe that scene worked so well, but the whole thing didn't work around it. So you have to let that go. And, and letting all that stuff flow around you, like the rock in the stream where the water just pools around, you just let it flow around you. That's This is my Zen Buddhist kind of take on it. You have to just flow with that. And I think that's really hard for, for writers. Yeah. Here's the irony. Uh, you know, I, I've spent, you know, at least a decade as a professional writer and director. And I just, I'm a firm believer in just like get the first draft out as quickly as possible. And I know it's going to be flat. I know it's going to need a lot of work. Uh, and so literally the only time in my entire career was recently I have a, a, dra a draft of something I'm developing most of the notes on the first draft are everyone going, it's great, don't change a thing. And I don't trust it. Because <laughs> I'm used to being, no, I have to, uh, this is just the first pass. I had to go back and redo this at least three times. <laughs> I read that, I read that script, by the way. It's pretty damn good, man. <laughs> well, that one I will say, I spent a lot more time fleshing out the outline and, and um, themes and that kind of stuff. Just having learned, and also just like the experience of working on James with Jonas, and just once we honed in on the theme, knowing how stronger it all got, 
I spent a lot more time up front on that kind of stuff, which I, which wasn't typically part of my process before, but now it is. Um, yeah, yeah, that was probably for, for getting into James versus his future self. I would say as writers, that was probably for both of us mutually. That was the biggest turning point was we felt we were, for the first year, we were writing the script that it had a theme, but we both knew that the theme was kind of lame and wasn't, it didn't feel deep enough and it didn't feel like us. And we kind of came up, we kept coming up against it because we, we knew that, it, that we, could, we could write funny around it. Ultimately, when we figured out what theme we wanted and the right theme for this movie, it was a complete start from beginning rewrite, but that was when we, we had confidence. I think we moved forward with confidence. And, and that was a big lesson for me too. I'm looking at the stuff I'm writing now, the stuff I'm story editing, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking deeper into theme. I think theme, great theme for me anyway, it, it's always something that emerges through the process. It's right. not, I've never sat down and gone, okay, what is the theme that I want to write it? What movie do I want to write and what is the theme? It always, it always uh, births itself, it comes out of the material, it sort of presents itself. And, and usually it's a big turning point for me in the writing. And it cer certainly was on this movie. I like that you said it comes out of itself like a baby entering the world with your head literally coming forward. Yeah. It's very, very descriptive. Well, um, yeah, I left out the details of the afterbirth and the yeah, various I other Nobody ever wants those yeah, Those are oh. called the producer notes. Afterbirth <laughs> is known as producer notes. <laughs> and, and poop comes out too, but you know, you, would, you kind of move the poop away and you just yeah. want to get scoop that baby out of it. Yeah, you can get a real bad infection if you don't get that shit out of the way. Yeah, get yeah. the poop. Geez, well, since you guys are my first three-way, I'm going to use a three-way term and just say, let's change positions for a minute oh. um, and talk about acting in a role that you've created and whether that's easier as an actor because you already know the character having written it. Did it just, was it just one take wonders the whole time? <laughs> no, uh, no, I'm not a very good actor. So in fact, it's uh, oh, that's it's, not that's we, not we, oh, no. I'm kidding. I'm a terrific actor. Uh, but it's it, but it, but it's it, but it's, it's also it, not true. But <laughs> yeah, okay, somewhere in the middle. Uh, let's let's agree on that. It, it, it's an interesting process uh, that I've talked about with Jeremy before as well. Because what happens is I I I'm writing this thing knowing that I'm going to be this character and often writing to my strengths and, and often thinking in the back of my mind, oh, that'll be fun to play, but not really digging in and, and sinking my teeth into it as an actor. There is a turning point, which I spoke about earlier, where we're getting into production, time to hand the script over to the director. It is now your movie. I'm still here if you need me as a writer and would love to contribute, but I'm an actor now. There, there comes a time, and I, I, every movie, this is the fifth film now where I've had a hand in writing it and then I've played one of the leads. I sit down with the script, I look at that beautiful title page, and I read it for the first time as actor Jonas. And it is fascinating. Every time, never fails. I catch things in it as the actor that I had written, that I wrote, but I'm looking at it now and going, oh, well, that doesn't really make sense. I mean, why would he do that if he's already said that? And, oh, this feels like it's a missed opportunity because why would I? And I'm able to come at it from an actor's POV and then I get to have Jeremy on the phone and I get to give notes as an actor. And, and we talk about various things that we didn't think about because I, I didn't have that actor's hat on. So it's a bit of a schizophrenic thing where it feels like I'm two people at once. I love it because it refreshes the material for me and I get to... By the time, and then we're on set, and even though I know the stuff, it's in my blood now, it's in my bones, I get to come at it kind of fresh. Um, and it, so in many ways, that is a joy. And I don't, I, the research has all been done, so I don't have to typically do any research at this point. I can just sit with the material and play with it and have fun. Yeah, That's I have a similar, I, I'm able to sit down when I first, I, I also go into like a director mode where I, similar to Jonas, um, read the script for the first time as a director and start seeing, start realizing, oh, that's overwritten. I don't need that. I can do that visually. Uh, but it's funny that I don't have that window earlier on in the writing process. It is a weird schizophrenic thing, but I think it's great because it's like, it's like, especially when Jonas and I are co-writing, it gives us like two fresh new readers at the end of our writing process right. to, to vet the script in a different yeah. way that we weren't necessarily thinking of. 
Uh, and, but again, that comes from like experience and that comes from that idea of what we were talking about earlier about separating yourself from the material and, and, and putting on different hats and brains and thinking about things different ways. Uh, it doesn't mean that just writing it from the writing point of view isn't important. You know, I don't think Jonas would write a very good script if he was writing from the actor point of view uh, no. from the get go. You know, I think we need to be able to do to compartmentalize those parts of ourselves and and we're lucky that we can do that. I think some people don't necessarily have that skill. So let's just talk about what would be a tip for both of you, uh, respectively to your positions. Maybe Jonah, start with you as a writer who then is acting that character or a character from the script that he's written. What piece of advice would you give to somebody who's maybe thinking of doing that for the first time earlier on in their career? Yeah, I would say don't think about what you're writing as an actor, think about it as a writer. And, it, um, and if you're thinking about it as an actor, uh, you're clouded and you're biased and, you know, at the most base level, you're like, well, what, what kind of exciting, great, dramatic thing can I have my character? I mean, you're, you're not servicing or serving the, sto the greater story, you're serving yourself. And I think, um, I think that's a, that's a, uh, that is a misstep. And mm -hmm. that's a, my advice would be, don't think of yourself as an actor when you're writing it. Think of yourself as a writer, and then you can come at it as an actor later. Nice. Yeah. Jeremy, what about you as a writer to transitioning to director? Oh, uh, I think it's just theme. It comes down to like the more you can focus in on theme at whatever stage, if you're lucky enough for it to present itself early on, I think you really have to step back. It'll help answer a lot of questions and weed out bad ideas and wrong paths. If you can just figure out what's the story I'm trying to tell, what's it about at its core, uh, then you'll know what scenes you need or don't need, what characters you need or don't need, what moments. You know, you want it to, you don't want it to be hit on its head. You want to try to be as clever and crafty and, and sly about it and subtext and all that kind of stuff. But I think the earlier you can figure that out, you know, the further ahead you'll be. And if it takes a while, it takes a while. You know, you, uh, you know, every movie needs a great story and a great hook, but it also needs a great theme and often they don't have both. And so, uh, whenever you can get both, that's when you have magic, you know? So I think that's the trick is just really, really knowing what's your point of view, what's your vision for this? What does it say about you as a storyteller and why you, why can only you tell this story in this way and not somebody else? Cause if, right you're writing something that anyone can make why are you doing it mm -hmm. nice well james versus his future self was supposed to have a theatrical release and as we all know nobody's going anywhere anytime soon before we get to letting people know where they can watch it on demand and on the various platforms i'm i'd love to know from each of you what you would tell your past self like a year from now what would you tell jonas going through what we're all going through who the hell knows what we're all, what, what's going to happen in a year? We have no idea. God, don't incite panic. Oh, I was at no frills this morning. Panic is incited. Yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a crazy, it's a crazy experience getting groceries these days. That's for sure. Yeah, Sorry, there was I, a guy. There was a guy at my at my, at my go grocery store yesterday who was wearing a full gas mask <laughs> and like a ha almost like a hazmat suit. So like Chernobyl and stuff. Yeah, sure. No, it, it freaked me out. I mean, maybe he was immune uh, compromised, but right. that, that freaked me out. That was a frightening image. Yeah. Um, what would you, what would a year from now, Jonas, come back and tell me right now? Yeah, like to, to get you through this time or, or what would you hope that you Oh, that's know? a better, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, here's what I think. That's a, I think about this a lot. We all have to, I, I think right now, everybody is on some level, trying to fight off the darkness that, that permeates our thoughts. We're trying to stay positive. On, we know, we, we do, we know that this is, that this, that life will return to normalcy at some point, some version of that, that we're going to go back to the way it was. Maybe things will be different forever, but a little bit in some ways. Yeah. So I want future, future me would come back and say like, dude, it's, you know, it's X weeks. You know, like, get over it. It's it, it, it's going to be fine. The, the world will survive this. They've had much worse than they've survived it. You're going to be all right. So, you know, 
get through those, those, let those dark moments pass mm -hmm. and just be with your family and be present and breathe the fresh air and, and just relax. Cause I do have my moments where I find myself, um, slipping into that spiral of, Oh my God, but what if this and this, what if this, and what if this, yeah. and what if, Oh my God. So I just, I would like myself to calm me down a little bit. Yeah, I'm on a roller coaster of emotions from just laughing from the light of it all to crying. Uh, I'm not kidding about that. <laughs> um, but like, I like to think that, um, and it's just, and, 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 and the tears are not like depressing tears. It's just more like, it's more like getting frustrated with just like things and just, uh, you know, I'm a person who needs a little bit of space and I don't have that right now. And I think yeah. what I would want uh, a year from now, Jeremy to tell right now, Jeremy is like, calm, just like Jonas was saying, calm down. Yeah. This is a once in a lifetime thing that's gonna happen. And what you don't want to look back on is you being a crazy idiot the whole time. What you wanna look back on is that you took the most out of this, this time and experience and opportunity to spend time with your loved ones in a way that you normally don't get to have, yeah. you know? We're so we're so blown up in this industry of always being busy. The industry shut down right now, and that's a terrible thing. But I think it's also kind of a great thing in some ways. I think we have to look at the the light of it, and I think the light of it is it it's given us all a vacation from ourselves in the way that we normally act and feel like we have to accomplish this much in this many days and all that. Nobody's reading scripts right now. Nobody's doing anything. Now is the time to kind of sit back and calm down and reflect and figure out what do you want the next couple of years of your life to look like? Mm -hmm. When and if things return to some form of a new normal? You know, I think that's a gift we've been given amidst this chaos and, and tragedy that if we don't take advantage of it, we're fools. We don't have to write our King Lear right now. But what we should figure out is, and is the kind of the core and the theme of our movie to bring it all back around is what is it like to be in the present right now? Mm -hmm. And how can we make a better life for ourselves coming out of this? I love that. Yeah. And I think that's actually what I would hope that most people would take away is what can we learn about this opportunity that we've all been given if we want to look at it as an opportunity instead of as a freak out challenge or um, situation. What can we take away from this that we might want to bring into the world, our own personal world, and put out into the greater world to each mm -hmm. other, to, to how we treat one another and to what we take so seriously, what we maybe should take more seriously. Mm -hmm. So hopefully we'll all come out of it a little bit better. I tell my kids, they're too young to get it, but I tell my kids, because they, they're actually having a great time. You know, they're, they're, they're building forts in the basement and making stop motion movies out of Lego and they're just loving it. And Amazing. they get mom and they're getting so much of me right now. That exactly. they're, they're very happy. I'm a, lot of I'm, I'm, a, I'm a pretty fun dad. But I keep saying to them, you know, you guys are going to look back at this. You're gonna, your grandkids are going to ask you, what was it like? when you lived through the quarantine and the virus and and you'll be able to, you'll, these stories, and they're like, what? What are you talking about? That's okay. They don't get the, so one of the advantages we have is that we understand context. Well, it's also a disadvantage in a lot of ways. My kids are ignorantly blissful, mm -hmm. uh, um, but, but the context that this is a moment in history, like that Jeremy said, it's once in a lifetime. These things, we track We hope, we hope, but, knock on wood. Well, you knock on wood. But typically, if you look at the history of pandemics, global, global pandemics, you get one every 100 years. So the next time one comes up, we're not going to be here. Our kids aren't going to be here. Um, this is our, you know, this is the thing that we will talk about, the wildest thing that we'll remember forever. And a lot of great art is going to come out of it. I understand. I don't feel the pressure to write my Lear, but I do know the history of that in particular. It might not be me or you, Jared, but somebody somebody many are going to do something amazing creatively and artistically that will come out of this as well so i'm curious to see what that's going to look like i'll say it's no one that's home with their kids i'm going to say that yeah you're right yes i guarantee it. <laughs> yeah i mean i think that there's a great meme going around that it's like our grandparents were asked to go and fight for their lives we're being asked to sit on the couch and watch netflix we're yeah. fine yeah exactly yeah, that's a good one 
Well, thank you guys so much, Jonas, Jeremy. Looking forward to James versus his future self. Let everybody know where they can stream it. Yeah, well, um, as of April 3rd, you can get it on digital. So it's on your friendly iTunes. Um, it's on Bell and Shaw On Demand. And then shortly thereafter, uh, you'll find it on TELUS and Rogers On Demand. Um, and yeah, we were we were ready. We were gearing up for a an eight city theatrical release, which was yeah. really going to be super fun for us. Um, but this is me telling week ago, Jonas, relax, man. No one's <laughs> going to movie theaters anyway. Uh, check this out on your, the comfort of your living room, and it's a nice ninety-three minute escape from all the dark stuff that you're thinking about all day. And, and it's really this is a warm hug of a movie. And you're gonna laugh and you know you might tear up but you're gonna feel good afterwards and i think that's kind of an important thing right now and yeah. so i hope that people find it yeah i thought it was important that we get the movie out now i think especially with what's going on it's a good movie for people to watch during this time but also just the nature of you know canadian theatrical we, we did have an opportunity to potentially have to have our theatrical come back when all this dies down but you know they can't guarantee us when and how and I just, I believe in being able to control as much as you can control in this incontrollable world and industry. And this is something we can kind of control right now. And I think there was some strength in that. And I think we've got a really great response from the festivals we've been doing. You know, we've been blessed with so many amazing uh, articles and interviews we've that we've had about the movie. We've gotten our Canadian Screen Award nominations mm -hmm. that we, we were not expecting to get, that we were very <laughs> flattered by. So, you know, we're really excited. I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm sad I won't be able to share it with an audience in the theater, but I've had the, the blessing of being able to do that for the last year in festivals. So I'm just excited that everyone in Canada will be able to watch this on April 3rd. Yeah. Maybe there will be some watch parties happening so people can share some joy and laughter together, but apart. Yeah. Uh, but we're looking forward to it. Thanks so much, guys. It's been such a pleasure chatting with you guys, as it always is. And I hope you both stay safe and uh, enjoy your time with your kids. Thank you. I will. And thanks so much for chatting. It was a nice uh, distraction for uh, 45 minutes to not uh, think about all that stuff. And I, I appreciate it. So thank you. My pleasure. Have a good day, guys. Bye. Bye.